All right. Well, let's start our study this morning uh, with a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we're grateful that your presence is here. We are gathered. We are gathered fearlessly here and look forward to hearing from you. Lord, we bring you praise, honor, and adoration, for you are indeed to be praised. And we are grateful for what you have done, and we're grateful for what you're doing for us as a nation. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue in this work that you've begun. We pray for those who lead us, Lord, that you would guide them, that they would be fearless and would be mindful of you and of your presence. We pray, Lord, for revival in our nation, that we would all come back to a point where we realize that our strength lies only in you and not in the external governments. Lord, we desire to have you be our ruler, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you know, uh, I began quite a long time ago, uh, as it goes, uh, uh, teaching in the book of Judges. Those of you who came here as David, uh, hoping to have a, a book on Revelation 13, uh, no such luck. Sorry about that. Uh, I began the, the book of Judges, and I've decided uh, when I have my opportunity to teach that I would teach continually through whatever book that I choose. And so uh, I started in Judges, and I want to go uh, uh, lesson by lesson. So we went on Wednesday, we were in the book of Judges, and today we're in the book of Judges. And since Judges is quite a bit longer than where I am now, uh, we'll be there well into next year as uh, I have opportunity to, to teach. After I get done with today, you might think that we're going to be well into next year just today. Uh, because this uh, eighth chapter of Judges is kind of a long uh, book. When Anthony gave me his schedule, he always uh, says, well, I, I, know, I know to expect it coming in this time of year that uh, he's going to go hunting. That's all there is to it. So, and so uh, I look forward to the time to be able to teach, and, uh, and it gives him an opportunity to get away without having to worry about things or even think about things. So um, uh, when he told me that he was going this week uh, to go, and I knew where I was going to be falling in the book of Judges, and I wanted desperately to be able to teach Wednesday's uh, lesson on Sunday and, and then put Sunday's lesson on Wednesday, but I decided I just can't do that. You've got to take it as it comes. You know, it'd be so much easier in filling in to just pick a topic or to pick a subject or to pick a scripture out of the air and, and do a teaching. That can be done. But I have always appreciated the, uh, the practice of Calvary chapels to teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And so I didn't get to handle Wednesday night on Sunday because that would have been the good one. That's, that's where all the action takes place with Gideon, because that's where we are with Gideon. And of course, Gideon is a famous story. It's a famous account. It's, it's something that we look to and we see lessons for life. And in the seventh chapter, we see shadows of the new covenant. That is, he's looking forward to, and we, because we're on this side of the cross, we can recognize that we are under the new covenant. And it's a whole new ball game for us. But we could have covered all of that. And it's where all the action was, was in the seventh. We're just going to do the mop up today. Uh, but all the action was in the seventh chapter. So uh, I'm going to digress just a little bit into the seventh chapter to set the, the place and to give you an idea. I did this on Wednesday, and I think it kind of helps to see what were the geography of what was going on, and where people were, and where it was headed for. So the battle, uh, Gideon has gathered his people. He gathered 32,000 men. And uh, they all come to where uh, Ophrah is, where he lives. And then they moved over on the other side of the valley, and they're overlooking the vast horde of Midianites that are down below. There's 135,000 Midianites down in this valley. So to put this in mind, then the way I figured it out on the map 
is if the southern end of the Sea of Galilee, if it were plopped down here in our territory, it would be just this side of Madras. And if Highway 97 was the Jordan River going down, well then this battle is taking place just a little bit north of Eagle Crest. And the tribes of Asher and Zebulun came down from Sisters. Naphtali came down from Crooked River Ranch. And, uh, and Manasseh comes up from Tumalo. And they are all meeting now in this area just north of, of uh, Eagle Crest. And the battle ensues. And as you remember from the, our Wednesday study, and uh, if you weren't there, then you can go back and review it if you like. But uh, in the Wednesday study, God makes this one statement that is just so true. He says, you know, I really can't bring about a victory here with so many people in the way. So we need to cut it down. So he says, tell, tell the ones that are afraid to, to go home. And so Gideon makes, he says, okay, anybody here who's just in fear and trepidation, if you've got any reservations whatsoever, you just feel free to go back to your, your home. And, you know, 20,000 guys got up and left. You know, 22,000 people left. And so now he's left with 10,000 men. And he's, I'm sure his eyes were wide and he's thinking, don't know how we're going to do this. When God tells him, no, there's still too many people. We need to pare it down. And so they do indeed pare it down. And he ends up with 300 men to fight against 135,000 men. And... Uh, they tell them what to do. They surround them at that area, and they have a pot, clay pots with a lamp inside of it that's lit so that nobody can see the light, and each man has a trumpet. And on Gideon's signal, they've surrounded the camp, and it's 10 o'clock at night, and they break the pots, and so all of a sudden there's this lights all around the camp. They blow the trumpets, and they yell, a sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And the people that are in the camp are just terrified. And they're running around in the dark. They're like chickens with no head. They're, they're swinging their swords like mad. And they're fighting each other. And they go to flight. And they take off. And so they all head off. And they get here to about Redmond. And uh, Gideon puts out the word. And so all the people who were afraid, well, now that they're looking at the backside of the enemy, the backside of the enemy isn't nearly as terrifying as the front side of the enemy. And so they uh, all join in the fight, and they're all kind of converging on that. He sends word down to Ephraim, who is uh, down in uh, the northwest crossing area of Bend. And Ephraim comes up and starts the fight, and they are running down south. They were going down parallel to uh, the Jordan River. And uh, that's kind of where our story picks up today in the first verse. Now, this is kind of a long chapter. And I want you to know that the chapter is divided into about nine places. But I promise you I will not preach a nine-point sermon, okay? We're going to zero in on the sixth, seventh, and the ninth sections of this because there's some uh, meaty stuff there. The rest of this is kind of setting the scene, seeing things happen, and, and there's some lessons to be learned, but we're not going to delve too deeply into all of those lessons. And so the first three verses is the first section, and this is the diplomacy with Ephraim. And uh, these guys from Ephraim, they've come down, they've chased uh, Oreb and Zeeb, uh, and they've killed these men. They got down to somewhere around Deschutes Junction when they did this sort of thing. And then they've, their part of the battle is kind of over, and they're feeling like, well, why didn't we get to be a part of this in the beginning? Why didn't you call on us? It says, and the men of Ephraim said unto him, why hast thou served us thus, that thou called us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. Hey, what goes here? And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebiezer? God hath delivered into your hand the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeeb, and was I able to do, in com and what was I able to do in comparison of you? He says, oh, guys, you did great. 
You've done much better than I. God, you took care of that. I couldn't do it. He used a little diplomacy on them. Oh, yeah. And their anger was abated toward him when he had said all of that. So the diplomacy is out of the way. Verses 4 through 9 are dealing with two little towns along the way. It says, And Gideon came to Jordan, and he passed over, and the 300 men that were with him faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Sukkoth, Now, by now he has run his 300 men, and he's chasing this crowd. And they are now down on the south end of Bend. And they've turned off to the east, and Sukkoth is about where uh, Woodside Ranch is. And they go to Sukkoth, and he says, um, he said unto the men of Sukkoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they are faint, and I am pursuing after Zebah and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Sukkoth said, Are the hands of Zebah and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread to, unto thine army? So what an attitude. You don't have anything. Why should we give you anything? You've got nothing for us. And so he says to them, and Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zamuna into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. He makes a promise. Something to be uh, made note of. Making a promise. So then he spake unto the men of Penuel. Penuel is now about where China Hat is. And he goes to them and he says the same thing. And uh, the men of Penuel answered him, just as the men of Sukkoth had answered him. And he spake unto the men of Penuel, saying, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Another promise made. Now, Zeba and Zamuna were in Karkor. And Karkor is about, is a little bit north and east of East Lake. So they're that far down now. And uh, they are in there, and it says, and their host is with them, about 15,000 men. That's all that's left. Uh, it says, uh, all that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew the sword. 120,000 men. Most of them killed by their own swords. Something that Gideon hadn't even begun to anticipate. And they are all set to flight because of fear. Those men were set to flight by fear of just 300 men. It doesn't amount to anything. There was nothing there. But because they were driven by fear, they were totally defeated. You think there might be a lesson to be learned here somewhere? I think so. And so it says that Gideon went up in the 11th verse, Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbaha, and he smote the host, for the host was secure. They thought they're safe, but here comes Gideon with his men, and uh, he uh, is again having success in the battle. And when Zeba and Zamunah fled, he pursued after them. So even their kings aren't standing, they're getting out of Dodge even more, as says, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmuna, and he discomfited all the host. So we've, we've accomplished the pursuit and capture, the third section. Now we're at the fourth section. Promises made, promises kept. Years ago, we went many times to a seminar. It was called the Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts. It started out as, and then it became the Institute in Basic Life Principles. And it was headed by a man by the name of Bill Gothard. 
and a very deep study. It was one of those things where uh, we would go to this week-long conference. It was every night and then all day Saturday. And we would go to it, and the, the first time you go to it, uh, and I think I probably went to it about six or seven times over the years. And um, uh, the first time you go there, you're thinking, oh, right, I want a drink of water. And the guy gives you a fire hose. <sighs> One of the things that uh, Bill taught there was uh, being consistent in dealing with your children and uh, carrying through with what you say you're going to do. Be careful what you say you're going to do. And so you should always be consistent and carry through with what you say you're going to do. And he told the story of a young man who related what happened to him when he was just a boy. That he was in the kitchen and he was banging on the refrigerator with a spoon. He was about five years old at the time, he said. He was banging on the refrigerator with the spoon. And his mother said, whatever his name was, Billy, said, Billy, stop that. He looks at her and bangs a few more times. Billy, stop that. He bangs a few more times. Billy, if you bang on the refrigerator one more time, I'm going to throw you out the window. He looked at her, he looked at the refrigerator, looked at the spoon, and he just had to see. And he banged like that, and to his horror, his mom went over and opened the kitchen window up, and she came over and grabbed him, and she threw him out the window. Fortunately, she had looked, and there was a snowbank out there to catch him. But for the rest of his life, he never questioned what his mother had to say. <laughs> promises made, promises kept. I can't help but uh, comment uh, on a political line that I have lived through the presidencies of, I think, 12 presidents now since Truman. And the president that we have now is the only man that has possessed that office in my lifetime who has said, when I'm elected, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And then he has gone and done each of the things that he said he was going to do, or at least attempted to do it, and is continuing to work at it. See, that's commendable. And so we find that Gideon comes with promises made and promises kept. And we start in the 13th verse. And Gideon, the son of Josh, returned from the battle before the sun was up. So it's still the darkness just at dawn time. And he caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth, and he inquired of him. And the young man, he described unto him the princes of Sukkoth and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. So there's 77 men that he has to deal with. And he came unto the men of Sukkoth, and he said, Behold, Ziba and Zalmuna, with whom ye did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmuna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men when they are weary? And he took the elders of the city, and thorns of the wilderness, and briars, and with them... He taught the men of Sukkoth. He made them to know. And then, in the 17th verse, and he beat down the tower of Penuel, and he slew the men of the city. And then he said unto Ziba and Zamuna, we start the 18th verse, which is the next section, the fifth section, which is a trial and an execution. You know, he didn't just willy-nilly do the things that were done. There's things you do in war, and there are lives that are lost in war. But there is a point where it can become an atrocity. You know, so we even have rules in war that we try to adhere to, just in order to preserve humanity and to show that we have some modicum of civilization. And so he didn't just willy-nilly kill these two men. Instead, he holds a trial for them. After all is said and done, the battle is over. 
The enemy has been routed. They're completely defeated. He has the two leaders, the men who started all of this in the first place, the guys who led everybody that invaded the country. And he gets these two men, and he said unto Zibah and Zalmunna, what manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? It's kind of up in Gideon's area. And they said, as thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. They were good looking. And Gideon says, said, he said, they were my brethren. Even the sons of my mother. That means they're not just friends. They're not just even family because, as we'll see a little bit later as we get in here, family situations can be very complicated. But these were his actual full brothers that Zeba and Zamina had killed. He says, as the Lord liveth, if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. And then Zeba and Zalmunah said, rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. There's a certain honor. And there is a certain knowledge that you do certain things, there's going to be a penalty to be paid. And there's a bit of honor, I think, in accepting what is that penalty when the time comes and it must be paid. And so it was that Gideon arose and he slew Seba and Zamuna. And he took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. Trial and execution. And now we come to the sixth section, the 22nd and 23rd verse. And these are kind of important. Kind of, uh, I want to cover one more thing, though. He took away these ornaments that were about the, the camel's necks. Uh, in the time, they would decorate their camels. The princes, uh, the king's camels, you know, probably covered with all kinds of jewelry and gold and with uh, colored robes and all that. And it's not at all unlike today. You know, if you are a person of wealth, you generally have things that show that you're a person of wealth. You know, you don't just drive a Ford, you drive a Bentley. You know, and you know, that uh, radiator ornament out there on the front, the grill, it's not just chrome, it's gold. It's gold. You want to have the things that show your wealth. And that's what these guys did. They wore the finest of robes. They're all wearing all kinds of jewelry and stuff. Even the common soldier, as we'll see a little bit later, we're wearing a lot of jewelry. And uh, it's kind of their savings, too, because uh, didn't have banks in those days. So I guess if you needed to pay for something, you can go and pick a bobble off your camel and pay for it. So uh, that's kind of how it was. And so the 22nd and 23rd verses are kind of key because all of this is settled down now, and everything's at, at peace, and everybody is uh, hoorah. Hoopla, you know, kind of, you've seen pictures, that, that iconic picture at the end of World War II. Remember that one, you know, where that sailor is laying a big kiss on the nurse, you know? And everybody's dancing in the streets, and there's happiness. It's victory day is declared. The war is over. There's no more war. There's no more war. And so the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And there's the temptation. And Gideon, to his credit, avoids the temptation, at least this one. And he says in the 23rd verse, 
He said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And that's the very point. It's the point that God, from the very beginning of time, has tried to make known to us time after time after time after time. That we were created that God might rule over us. And not that he would rule over us with some kind of tyranny or with some kind of forcefulness, but that he might rule over us because we ask him to. Lord, rule over me. That is the effective relationship with God Almighty. And this is what the new covenant is all about. Ceasing to, to uh, try to rule our own selves and asking God to do it. Ceasing from trying to put our own efforts into everything and sitting back and allowing God to do it in our life. Recognizing that there is no amount of work or battle that we can do. Knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. The credit belongs to the Lord. In 1 Samuel 17, I don't think I've, I thought I had it written here, but I, I must not. <laughs> Terrible. It'll be up there. Then said David to the Philistine, and I think of this, this is, this is so indicative of David. This is why he was such a strong person. This is why he was a man after God's own heart. Because here he is, a youth. He's out there in the battlefield, and he's facing this giant that's across the way. And this is what he says to the man. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. That's the kind of attitude and authority we should face life with. Because heaven knows life presents us with Goliath from time to time. And this is the kind of confidence that we need to have in the Lord God Almighty. Because he can do it. See, this is the new covenant. Paul expressed it. I talked about it on Wednesday at length. But in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, Paul says this. And he's been explaining and expounding about what this new covenant is all about. He says, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ... That means we in our lives, the way we are living our lives, we are an open book to the world around us. And the world is reading us. And he says, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on external tables of stone, rules to be kept, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. Our relationship to, be, to God is not one of religion. The relationship, the right relationship to God is not in the keeping of rules and regulations or going through rituals or having certain things in our life. That's not it. It's what takes place in the very most private parts of each and every one of our individual hearts. 
Each one of us is the temple of the Holy Spirit. See, this is the new covenant. We reach the seventh uh, section. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. You know, you ever notice that there are certain people or groups or whatever, you, you kind of know who they are. You know, you always know the hell's angels because they ride in on bikes like this and they have stuff on their, on their leather uh, jackets, you know, and we have certain people dress certain ways and all that kind of stuff. Well, they knew these guys had earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment, and they did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. Uh, besides the ornaments and the collars and the purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were about their camels' necks. So he gathers the gold. And this alone can be a snare. Gathering gold can be a snare for all of us. I think of the sadness of the number of people who spend their entire life gathering gold and they've made no preparation for eternity. Because just as surely as we came into this world with nothing, we go out with exactly the same amount. When I leave this earth, I'm going to leave with exactly the same amount as Bill Gates does. Absolutely. And so the gathering of gold can be a problem. And this was a lot of gold, uh, 1,700 shekels of gold, a shekel being about 11 and a half grams, which means that the gold was about... 42 pounds of gold in that rig. 42 pounds, that's a hefty load of gold, you know. And uh, today's worth, that would be, and besides that, he had all this other gold, so maybe there's another 10 or 20 pounds of gold that is getting put into the pot too. So the worth of that, uh, the spot gold today is $1,886 an ounce. And so that means that this gold was worth anywhere from a million two hundred and sixty thousand dollars to a million eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So a sizable amount of money was gathered uh, for him at this point. And it becomes a snare. So he uh, says in Gideon, and here's what happened. And Gideon made an ephod thereof, and he put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Now he thought it was a good thing to do. He's thinking, well, you know, I'm going to have certain responsibilities in the community now, and uh, important people should have important things. And we all know that from the, the teaching that the priesthood, they all wore an ephod. It's a kind of a heavy linen garment like this. It's interlaid with uh, gold and with jewels, one thing or another. So he made his ephod that he could wear. Maybe he wore it on official occasions when he was judging the people because they would come to him and he would be settling things for them over the time. And uh, so he made this thing, and it must have been very, very ornate. It was kind of a thing to look at. I mean, in fact, it was the thing in Ophrah, the thing. And people would come from far and wide, and pretty soon they're not looking upon it as a garment. It becomes a thing. You know, maybe they could, some people might come to it, because maybe if I crawl on my knees to it, I'll get what I'm desiring, even without asking Gideon, and certainly without asking God. But maybe I'll just go and I'll, I'll do some kind of obeisance to it. And maybe, you know, somebody, some kind of a miracle happens because they went and they looked upon this ephod. And so it becomes something to worship. It becomes an external thing. And this is what we have to be concerned about. This is a problem in churches sometimes. I have seen this happen. You get into a building project 
And suddenly the building project becomes the ephod. And everybody's attention is turned to that. Been a number of years since I've been in a building project. And I had a little bit of uh, trepidation when years ago we were out here and we had the plans drawn for the new church building that we were going to build. And I was, okay, we're going to do it. But I have to say that the attitude then of the guys who were leading everything was whole different than other churches I've been in that have building projects. Because usually the building projects in include fund drives and badgering people and asking them to give and give and give to another. And that's one of the things I've always liked about a Calvary chapel, chapel is that if God provides it, then we're going to do it. If he doesn't provide it, then we're not going to do it. Period. I thought, how refreshing is that? So the last building project that we were in up in Seattle at the church that we attended, we were meeting in a school building and there was just, we're running out of room. The church was growing. We had gone to about 500 people and uh, it was getting to be a big thing. And uh, we, needed, we needed to build. We had land on which to build and all that. So there were a couple of ways to do it. And one of those ways is to get a big honking loan and uh, commit ourselves to the couple million dollars or whatever it was and that we'd have to do. And so there then arose a division in thinking in the church. And it wasn't violent by any means. At least I didn't feel violent about it. And I was in the camp over here that said, you know, maybe we should just take a deep breath and let's pray about it and see what God provides for us and, and go with that. And the other group over here said, no, we got to do it right now. And we got to borrow the money and we've got to commit ourselves to this. And we've got to show faith and we're going to blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, well, we really ought to wait. So we had a, the kind of church government we had there was that everybody votes on it. And there was a vote taken and the borrow the money group won the vote. And so we borrowed the money and we went out there and built the first part of the building project. And it was quite nice. It was a lovely facility that we built. But before even a year had gone, the people who wanted to borrow the money all went somewhere else. <laughs> Thinking, there must be a lesson in there somewhere. So it becomes a snare when external things take our devotion in this way. So then it says in verse 28 that there was peace for 40 years. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted up their heads no more and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. And Yerubbaal the son of Yoash went and dwelt in his own house. And then we come to is that ding mean I should be shutting up? Is that We come to the ninth part of this, which is the end part, and it's the decline and defeat. You know, back in the 70s, uh, there was a great race. Uh, we, I am just totally out of time. I can't believe it. There was a great race. I don't know if you remember Secretariat. There's a movie that was uh, done. It's a great movie. I think I'll watch it again. I just love that movie. But I can remember it happening at the time, how he won the Triple Crown. The first two races, he won by two and a half lengths. And the third race, I don't know what was going through that horse's head. But he always started it in the back of the crowd and then took off. And it was amazing to watch as this horse just took off. And he ended the last race. He set a track record at the Belmont that has not been broken now. It's been nearly 50 years. And he won by 31 lengths. Amazing story. The point of the story is that was his last race. They only raced to a certain point, and then they, and then they do something different, and they put him out to stud, and he spends the rest of his days just creating little horses, <laughs> and he created 663 folds, and I'm kind of thinking, you know, that's not that much different than Gideon.
We start in verse 30, 29. It says, uh, And Yarub Baal, the son of Yoash, went and dwelt in his own house, and Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten. Three score. That is 70 boys. That's just the boys. Remember, I told you that these family things are complicated. So, he says, for he had many wives. But having many wives is not enough. He has to have a lady on the side also. And his concubine was that in Shechem, that was in Shechem. She also bare him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Yoash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher. And Yoash, his father, in Ophrah, the Abiez writes. And it came to pass that as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again, and he went a whoring after Baalim. And they made Baal Berith their god. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of their enemies on every side, neither showed they any kindness to the house of Jaru Baal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness that he had showed unto Israel. Decline and defeat. You know, it started fairly early on in the early generations after Adam. The man loses track of the fact of how God had set things up to be. God set up for us to have one man, one woman, one lifetime. Matthew 19, 3 through 6. The Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? That's binary, by the way. There are only two sexes in spite of what we're being told today. There are not 23 sexes, you know. There are only two. And he said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain, the two of them, shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That is the perfect situation, and obviously Gideon did not meet the perfect situation. And all it led to was decline. He didn't even see it happening to him. He's just living life and doing what all the other guys are doing. Going with the flow, Daddy-o. <laughs> He's not even knowing that people have turned from worshiping the God that he told them was to rule over their life. They have forgotten that. And instead, they've turned their attention to an ephod. And they're just going about their business as if nothing's going to happen. You know what? Lessons are written here for us for two reasons. One is for us to follow, and one is to avoid. And this is the one we should avoid. And when we look back in life, we realize that there's a whole lot of things that we should have avoided. And we didn't. And God has made a place for that. Because he has said, you turn to me and I'll remember that no more. As if it didn't happen. So we come to communion. And a lot of times we come to communion, we're thinking, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. And you know what? You are absolutely right. None of us is worthy. Communion is not about you and me. Our communion is about the Lord Jesus Christ, who has done it all. He's the one who said, it is finished. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 29, I'm going to read this. He says, for I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They're celebrating the Passover. 
They're all familiar with the Passover. And he breaks the loaf, the loaf with the stripes on it. The loaf that they would break and then they would hide a piece and then the kids would go and find that piece and bring it back. And he breaks it and he says, this is my body. That's what this is. You've been celebrating that. This is what it is. This is what it stands for. This is what it means. Now, as often as you do it from now on, remember me. It's not about what Moses did. It's about what Jesus did. And after the same manner also, he took the cup which he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, that new covenant, the covenant that only goes into place when the one, the testator dies. The New Testament doesn't start in Matthew. The New Testament starts in Acts. The New Testament didn't come into being until Jesus died. And he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body of Christ. So remember God as we do this. And let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily is not remembering what God has done, and not being thankful for what God has done, and not giving praise for what God has done. He eateth and he drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. See how important that is? Let's pass out the stuff. Somebody come play music. <laughs> 